Started. Um, most everybody's here, obviously, nobody else out there. Tonight, we have uh, three parts to tonight. Uh, Paul Crawford with the County Attorney's Office, Assistant County Attorney, will be the first part. Just talk a little bit about uh, how the County Attorney's Office works with us and how we work with them on cases and different things for trials, uh, stuff like that. After he's done, uh, Lieutenant Chris Roush will be up here to talk about bike patrol. He's going to bring bike up and all this fun stuff that he does for an hour. And then, um, Emergency uh, 901 Comm Center. We have Teresa Lang and Stacy Rhodes coming up. We'll be doing the last hour. Okay, uh, anything else? Paul's got the first hour, then I'll come back and get some stuff up for you, and we'll go from there. All right, enjoy your evening. Thank Paul? You, Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. You. you are a lawyer and an attorney, huh? Yes, okay. yes. I've never had any dealing with well, well, that's good. <laughs> I hear they're very smart, very intelligent. Ooh, well, I, I hope I can live up to that expectation. So. My name is Paul Crawford. I am the uh, first assistant or chief deputy uh, count in the county attorney's office. Uh, I've been with Marshall County Attorney's Office since 1987, so just starting my 28th year here. Uh, before that, I uh, worked for a couple years over in the Story County Attorney's Office. And then I was in uh, one year as a uh, lawyer on the, uh, the other side of the fence, so to speak, as a, uh, a private uh, practice lawyer, uh, did some criminal defense work and uh, decided I didn't like that. So I came back to uh, the uh, good side or the side of truth and justice, as I like to think of it, <laughs> and went back to the county attorney's office. What I'd like to talk to you about tonight is uh, what the county attorney's office does, what it consists of, and kind of walk you through the uh, at least the important stages of a particular uh, criminal case. Um, so let me see if I can get things started here with the what we do. We are the chief law enforcement agency in Marshall County. Uh, the sheriff and the police departments uh, all work with us uh, to try and protect uh, the community and enforce the laws. Right now we have roughly 1,300 uh, pending criminal cases. And that's not including our traffic tickets. These are just uh, actual non-traffic crimes, so we have quite a few. When I started here in 1987, we had started out with uh, like 300 <coughs> cases. And so you can see the the numbers have gone up over the years. We also, in addition to being in court and prosecuting criminal matters and traffic matters, we have uh, the task of helping folks who have filed for involuntary mental health commitments uh, on people that uh, are believed to have uh, be mentally impaired and need uh, assistance in getting treatment and don't want to get that treatment uh, by themselves. We also, uh, when asked, uh, advise the various county offices, uh, the Board of Supervisors, the Engineer, uh, Treasurer, uh, the Auditor. If they have legal questions, uh, they can come to us and uh, ask what our legal opinion is on those matters. We also are involved with uh, court pursuit of forfeiture of uh, seized property. You know, the wine registers had quite a uh, uh, series of articles uh, disparaging uh, that process. Um, free to talk about that if we want to uh, a little bit later. We also have quite an effective delinquent fine collection program. We're trying to uh, uh, get people uh, squared away with the uh, fines that they owe uh, and at the same time uh, bring money back into the uh, uh, court coffers as well as the, uh, the county budget. Uh, we also work with law enforcement to uh, train them. Uh, we get trained ourselves each year. The lawyers are expected to have uh, at least 15 hours of uh, what's called continuing legal education, and at least two of those hours have to be involving ethics. I know that's kind of hard to believe lawyers and ethics uh, go together, believe it or not. Um, but we uh, get trained ourselves, and then we also uh, work with the uh, 
police and the sheriff's departments to uh, train them, particularly uh, every July 1st, new laws take effect. So uh, we get trained on the new laws and then we uh, hold training sessions with the law enforcement agencies to update them and tell them uh, what to expect uh, as far as how to uh, make a case with changes in the law. And then if I'm able to cover everything in, four, in less than an hour, then we're going to go through each one of the 85 other duty, duties of the county attorney that's uh, <laughs> listed in the code. But no, we're not going to do that. No. What we don't do, um, a lot of folks think, well, a county attorney is the go-to resource if you have uh, a legal question and want the answer. Uh, for example, uh, someone calls and asks us, uh, uh, can you help us write a will? Uh, can you help me file for a divorce? Things of that sort. Those are things that we as the county attorney's office cannot do. Uh, we are full-time criminal prosecutors. So what we can do is those things that I talked about in the last slide. What we can't do is uh, get involved in uh, uh, representing someone, uh, say, in those situations, say like a divorce or writing up a will or something like that, suing somebody uh, for something. Uh, we can't help you in that regard. Uh, in that situation, we need to go to a, a private attorney, basically, as we tell people, uh, somebody in the phone book, uh, go talk to them, uh, see what they charge, see what they're willing to do. Uh, if you don't like them, then go to another person that's in the phone book. But that's basically uh, what we can't do. Our staff, like I said, we started out, when I was here in 1987, we started out with three attorneys, the county attorney and two assistants. We now have eight full-time attorneys. Uh, Jennifer Miller is the county attorney, and we have seven assistants. Uh, Jennifer uh, sends her apologies, she's not able to make it tonight. She uh, was up in Fort Dodge. The uh, Morales murder trial uh, began today up there, so that's what she's uh, doing for the rest of this week and maybe into next week. As I said, we have eight attorneys. Uh, Jennifer is the county attorney. The county attorney is an elected official, so every four years, uh, candidates for the county attorney appear on your ballot in November, and you get to decide uh, who you want to be your county attorney. Jennifer has been the, she just recently got elected last fall. Uh, she'll be starting her fourth term now as county attorney. Uh, so I've been here 28 years. I've worked for three different county attorneys and um, briefly a county attorney appointed to be a county attorney for about six months um, after a uh, previous county attorney suddenly resigned and so I took the, uh, the lead and then uh, Jennifer beat me in the election that fall but she was nice enough to uh, hire me on and uh, let me keep working, doing what I like to do. Uh, we have, uh, Jennifer and I pretty much take the lion's share of the felony cases, and those are the cases that uh, basically you're looking at uh, more than two years uh, in prison for a maximum possible punishment. Uh, Jennifer and I uh, take the lion's share of those. Uh, I do uh, prosecute the, pretty much all the sexual assault cases, so whether the victim is an uh, adult uh, victim or a child victim, uh, I work with them uh, to try and uh, uh, get justice for them in those kind of situations. We have a number of other felony crimes, uh, robberies, uh, burglaries, arsons, uh, murder, attempted murder, um, thefts, if theft is of a certain value, then it's a felony. Uh, assaults, uh, some kinds of assaults can be felonies. And so those are the variety, wide variety of the cases that we handle. Uh, Jordan in our office does all the OWI or operating <coughs> intoxicated the drunk driving cases. Jim and Ben split up the drug cases. Uh, drugs have sadly evolved uh, over time. I remember when I got here, marijuana was the big thing. Uh, it was kind of the uh, start of, say, cocaine. Uh, you know, Miami Vice was popular, so. Uh, cocaine started spreading to uh, the rural areas. Uh, then uh, meth back then was, what is meth? We, we have no idea what that was in the late 80s. Uh, th <coughs> things have changed now. Uh, pretty much all the cases are uh, meth. We have some marijuana cases. Uh, sadly, a lot of the new cases uh, over the last few years have been people 
uh, abusing prescription drugs, basically uh, using, stealing somebody else's drugs, using them, possessing them, uh, things of that sort, and that's, uh, I think, the, the rising uh, kind of drug you know, crime we're seeing here in Marshall County is the, is the prescription drug abuse. Uh, Sarah uh, is our domestic violence prosecutor. Uh, she has probably, sadly, about 65, 70 active cases now of uh, domestic violence uh, here in town. Um, Kyoko is the person that you most likely would see, but most likely wouldn't want to see, and that is uh, she does the traffic cases. So if you have speeding case, uh, something of that sort, uh, she might run into her in, uh, in court on those kinds of cases. Luke is our juvenile court prosecutor. Uh, I talked with him today and he said he's, he has basically, there's three different kinds of juvenile court cases. One is juvenile delinquents. Those are people that uh, essentially commit crime. These juveniles are basically the group of uh, offenders that are under 18 years of age. So you can have juvenile delinquency. Uh, that would be uh, people that commit crimes, uh, but they're younger than 18. You have um, child in need of assistance situations where for some reason or another family can't take care of the children that they have and so they need uh, court intervention and uh, social service assistance uh, to uh, try and uh, improve uh, the situation for the kids and for the families. And so what the courts will do is give them an opportunity, period of time to work with the uh, social service agencies and try and improve their situation and then if that doesn't uh, work after a period of time then we can move on to what's called a termination of parental rights if the parent's not going to step up and work with the agencies and try to be the, uh, the good parent and, and do the best they can for their children then the court uh, can make a decision to potentially terminate that parent's uh, right to that child and the child is uh, uh, adopted out to, to uh, other families who will take care of them. So those are the areas that Luke's involved in. And I should have mentioned earlier, if you've got questions at any point, you know, raise your hand and uh, feel free to uh, jump into the discussion. But that's our office. And on any Mondays, or what we call our court service days, so that's probably our busiest court day. And we have five different judges going at one time and uh, four different courtrooms uh, busy. We can have the magistrate court going, we can have the uh, juvenile court going, we can have the uh, district associate court which is the, uh, the serious misdemeanors and aggravated misdemeanors, that's Judge Riley, and then we have the uh, district court which is the felony cases and that's uh, the local judges or Judge, uh, Judge Haney and Judge Ellison. And so Mondays are pretty busy for our uh, court activities. Uh, we have trial dates, and I'll get to those in a, in a little bit. Um, but that keeps us hopping. We also have in our staff, we talked about delinquent fine collection. Jennifer started a program about four years ago, and it's been quite <coughs> successful. We brought in uh, $1.2 million uh, in back uh, money that was owed either to the county or the state for uncollected fines, or more importantly, for victim restitution. That is, uh, uh, victims that have been, uh, say, their homes have been broken into and they've had uh, uh, items stolen. Uh, if insurance didn't cover those, uh, or a uh, drunk driver hits them and the, the vehicle gets totaled or is above insurance coverage, uh, then that's something that the criminal is responsible for. We also have a victim witness coordinator. Yes, sir. Yes. You, you said it, just the previous one. So the, the court used to kind of do that, or or now you you say to those who are convicted, if you want to, you can work with us, and then you'll take that to the court. Yes. Because yes. you'd have to do that. I yes, would we would still need the court's court's blessing and approval yeah. of the payment plans. And if the person were to, say, stop making their installment payment or, or you know, fail on their payment plan, then we'd notify the court, we'd notify the DOT, and the DOT would take away their license. So uh, there are consequences to 
them not uh, following the plan that they signed up for. Um, Andrea is our victim witness coordinator. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of crimes that involve victims. I talked about the, the sexual abuse uh, crimes. Obviously, uh, those are victims. Uh, Rick talked about uh, three domestic assault calls. Well, domestic, anyone who's been assaulted is a victim. Uh, someone who's uh, had their uh, home burglarized or something stolen from them, uh, they're victims too. And what Andrea does is work with them, uh, let them know that uh, you have some rights as victims uh, in this process. Uh, she will notify you, uh, let them know that uh, you've been you can register as a victim so you can keep tr track and keep notice of uh, what's going on in a particular uh, case as it progresses through the court. Uh, you also have the, uh, the biggest impact is uh, if the person pleads guilty or goes to trial and loses, then they face their punishment. You as the victim have the opportunity to come in and speak to the offender as well as the judge at the time the judge is deciding the punishment. And I, I've seen some very powerful uh, victim statements uh, from people that uh, uh, have suffered great, great losses at the hands of the offender and they, they come in and basically I, I explain to them that this is your time to vent. If you want to vent uh, on paper, you can write it out and we can submit that to the judge. But if you want to vent verbally and come in and uh, you know, five feet away from the offender, you know, tell them off. Uh, five feet away from the judge and say, judge, this is what I think ought to happen to this offender. And it's a, a very um, catharsis, I can't pronounce that word. <laughs> it's a very good experience, I think, for the, the victims to, uh, what they told me afterwards, that uh, they, they felt better to, to get it off their, their chest. We also have um, two administrative assistants. Um, what they do is, you obviously answer the phone, uh, try to direct your calls to the uh, appropriate attorney. Uh, they also do a lot of data entry. Uh, used to be uh, that we would uh, type up uh, documents, we'd go to the copy machine, make three copies, go up to the court, court's office on the fourth floor, uh, stamp all three of those copies, and then we'd go to this mailbox uh, that's up there for all the attorney's offices in town, and we'd uh, put uh, the copy to the defense attorney and whoever else needed to know. Uh, that's how we did distribute things. Well, the last, I think since 2012, Marshall County has been involved with the uh, electronic uh, court filing system. So now everything's done by, the, by electronics. We uh, uh, type something up, we uh, send it to the uh, judge uh, by electronics. The judge looks at it puts an electronic signature on the document, uh, notifies that the clerk that has been filed, and the clerk then distributes it electronically. So the uh, legwork is taken out of it, and uh, unfortunately the, uh, uh, the opportunities we have to you know, go up and talk to the judge and you know, meet the judge and say, here judge, here's our papers, uh, and things of that sort, that uh, face time is gone through the electronic process, so I, I kind of miss that. But it does make things a lot uh, quicker and uh, less paper involved, too. Uh, try to walk through a, I guess, the various high points of a, of a criminal case and tell you what that's about. It starts out with the arrest. So the law enforcement agency makes the arrest. Now that can be one of two different ways. Uh, of course, every time you see on TV, it's always the uh, cuff them and put them in the car and take them to jail situation. That is an arrest. The courts also consider it to be an arrest if you are given a citation, that is a ticket. Uh, say you're caught speeding and they don't take you to jail, uh, but they write you a ticket and you're still for the court processing times and things, uh, they still consider that to be an arrest. So uh, you can be either arrested or cited. And either way, it gets the case started. The reports uh, from those situations, whether they be uh, the, the traffic ticket citation or the uh, uh, lengthy police report about an arrest situation, those all get uh, funneled from the uh, officer who writes the, 
the reports. Uh, that get passed on to the county attorney's office, uh, and we review that. And we then uh, make a decision about whether the case proceeds. And what happens, first court appearance is, literally enough, called an initial appearance. And that usually happens within 24 hours after somebody's arrested. It's supposed to. Uh, I've had some situations where uh, the jail staff will tell the judge uh, at 8.30 that, uh, the next morning, this person's too drunk to, to see you. They're not going to understand what's going on. And so the judge will say, okay, well, there's a good excuse. We'll, we'll see him tomorrow or we'll see him later today. But typically, if somebody gets arrested, say, today or tonight, they're going to be seen by a judge at 8.30 you know, the next morning. And what will happen in that initial appearance is the judge will tell them, Okay, this is what you've been accused of doing. This, this, is, the, this is the crime or crimes uh, you're accused of. The judge will tell them what the maximum and minimum punishments are uh, for the crime. Uh, the judge will schedule what's called a preliminary hearing uh, if it is a serious enough crime, or the judge will schedule a trial date if it's a, a, a simple misdemeanor or a traffic ticket. A judge will do all those things, and probably the most important thing is the judge will decide what their bail or their release conditions are. And uh, first, judge may set a uh, um, bond amount, say you can post that, but it's got to be cash. So I'll come up with $1,000 cash only or $5,000 cash only, something like that. Uh, or the judge may say, uh, you can uh, be released on your own responsibility, ROR is what they call it. Uh, basically, it's, we trust you enough, uh, your record's uh, non-existent or limited enough, that we're going to trust you to show up uh, uh, for your next court appearance, so we'll, we'll let you go. Uh, or judge may find a middle ground and say, we're going to release this person, but it's going to be, you're going to be supervised by the probation office on a pretrial release. So you've got to check in with them so many times a week, let them know where you're living, where you're working, things of that sort, so they can keep track of you. you know, we don't think you're necessarily a, um, a risk to commit more crimes, but uh, we think you've, you've got enough on your, in your past that we're still leery about just cutting you loose with no strings attached. So we're going to have some sort of pretrial supervision uh, on you. So those are the decisions the judge uh, has to make at the initial appearance. The plea, everybody pleads not guilty at the arraignment stage. Uh, and people often ask me, why? I mean, if they know they did it, you know, why don't they just you know, get it over with? And I have some theories as to why that takes place, but probably the best example I can give you is I had a situation where uh, silent alarm went off at a business, police responded, uh, waited outside uh, the front door, out comes the burglar, loop in his hands, surrounded by five police officers. He's obviously guilty, <laughs> but yet come this stage arraignment, goes the police not guilty. What is going on? You know, how, how screwed up is that? And I just try to explain folks, it's, it's simply the way the way the process works, whether you like it or not, I can see the rationale for the offender, the accused offender doing that. Uh, if it's a, a crime that they're looking at going away for a long time, they're going to plead not guilty and try and buy as much stall as long enough they can so they can you know, be out you know, or, or you know, be at least in a local jail where they can see family and see friends as opposed to going off to uh, Fort Madison or Anamosa for prison for a while. So that, that's a motivation for them to plead not guilty and you know, prolong their, uh, uh, their destiny that they know they're going to get at the end. Uh, they also have a strategy for uh, witnesses. Uh, if a witness is, uh, may move away, a witness may forget, uh, the witness and the offender may reconcile, get back together. And so the longer I try and push things off, uh, push the consequences out, maybe something will change with the, uh, uh, the witnesses. And the case, state's case won't be as strong later on down the road. So that's why 
least in my mind, that's what, what, why they do what they do. Then finally, the fifth step is pre-trial and trial. Now you get a trial date, and between the arraignment and the trial date, a lot of things can happen. You can have discovery, which means I have to show the defense attorney, okay, this is all the evidence we've got against your client. So they get to know, you know who it is and what the evidence is against them. Um, they get to take depositions, which are sort of like pre-trial interviews. Uh, it's not in the courtroom, there's no judge or jury involved. Basically, you come to a conference room, uh, the lawyers are there, uh, the offender is there, uh, and the offender gets to hear and see each one of the witnesses come in, and the lawyers take turns asking them questions in front of a stenographer, a court reporter, and the witness is sworn in to tell the truth uh, before they get started. And so that way the lawyers have a chance to ask the witness more detailed questions um, and try to get information. And also uh, what I tell people is it's discovery. It's time for us to discover information, what you know about the case and as you're a witness, but also it gives the defense a chance to discover what are you gonna be like as a witness? You know, can they push your buttons? Can they upset you? Uh, can they get you angry? Can they get you tearful? Uh, can they get you forgetful? Uh, see what, you know, how you do. And so that is a very important time uh, before trial. We have pretrial hearings and motions. If a person thinks that the police wrongly got a hold of some evidence, you know, they marched right in my house, you didn't have a search warrant, you know, you took stuff out, you found stuff that uh, make me look bad, you know, I'm going to challenge that. Uh, or even if you did have a warrant, uh, I think you, you did something wrong. Or, or uh, motion to suppress. Uh, a, another thing, a motion to, um, you know, if, if the offender, offender's lawyer doesn't believe that they're competent, legally competent to uh, proceed with the trial. That is that they, they just don't understand uh, the nature of the legal proceedings. They have a, some sort of a mental uh, illness or deficiency, uh, they can ask the court to, you know, take a time out, let's send them to uh, a psychological workup and decide whether or not uh, this person is uh, appropriate to uh, proceed on in, in the criminal uh, system. Then, it's an awful phrase, plea bargaining. Yes, it happens. Part of the reason it happens is because, you know, I talked about we had 1,300 cases pending, okay. Um, we have 20 potential felony trial dates each year and uh, 12 trial dates for misdemeanors. So you can't fit every potential case. If everybody wanted a trial, we couldn't give it to them. So we've got to make decisions about, uh, and part, uh, a lot of that is based on you know, how strong is our case. If it's good, you know, we're going to be uh, more likely to go forward and want uh, higher punishments if we've got some weaknesses to it. Uh, we may think that uh, getting something in terms of a plea bargain is better than uh, getting nothing uh, going in, into a trial situation. Um, we look at their, in trying to decide what we recommend, you know, like I said, we look at their history, uh, we look at uh, what they've done, uh, we talk to the victims, uh, get their input. Uh, but it does happen. There's just simply no way around uh, trying to say the plea bargaining doesn't happen because it, it does. That was their Okay, next part is bike patrols. Lieutenant Chris Roush, it's all yours. All right. Well, I need to apologize to you all, um, just in general. Um, I hear you guys have been talking about, you know, uh, like lawyer stuff and, and uh, you know, other 
other things with law enforcement, but uh, um, now you get to talk about bicycles, um, which is where you know the money's really at, and uh, it's, it's actually you know interesting. Um, my name is Lieutenant Chris Roush. I'm the uh, I'm the ship commander for the 311 ship, which we call the, either the 311 ship or the afternoon ship. And uh, um, I've been a bike officer since 2001. Um, I rode about five summers almost exclusively, and then um, I got promoted out of the best job I ever had and uh, became a detective. I'm not really quite sure why at this point, but uh, um, here we are. And, uh, um, but uh, I became an instructor in 2003, um, and I've been training uh, uh, new, new officers uh, ever since then. I really don't get a chance to get out on the bike anymore. Um, unless I'm training other officers, um, or like today, I got my um, bike down and I tuned it up and um, was getting ready for um, this class and um, decided I needed to go check it out outside. Um, so I went for a short um, little ride in my shorts and people were really amused, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, kind of the bike patrol, um, and we'll just kind of talk about um, what that means here. Um, we have three centuries of bike patrol. Uh, I used to tell people that uh, our bike patrol actually started in 1994-95, um, when in actuality it actually started in the 1890s, um, because everybody rode bikes back then. Um, we didn't have really have patrol cars. If you look at the old, um, if you look at the old uh, pictures that we have in the police department, you'll see like what looks like a paddy wagon and some dog and a bunch of bicycles. Um, so actually, we've had. Uh, bike patrol for uh, well over 100 years now. Um, we reintegrated the, the program back in the 1990s, um, and the program uh, still goes on until today. Um, this would have been what a bike looked like back in uh, the 1890s. Uh, we, this is not a Marshalltown police officer, um, but I couldn't find any pictures of any bicycles. I'd actually be interested to know if the bicycles that we used were Fisher bicycles, because Fisher made bicycles as well um, when they weren't making so much money on uh, uh, those valves. Um, but this is what a bicycle would have looked back then. Um, very, very common to have a, a police officer on a bicycle. Um, one of the easiest ways to get around and, uh, um, you know, policing was a little different back then. You went and checked all the different businesses and, and uh, a bicycle makes that a whole lot easier than actually driving around in a car. The uh, um, this is from a class I put on in 2005. Um, uh, this is what uh, bike patrol looks like now, other than the yellow shirts. We went from yellow shirts to um, gray shirts um, two years ago. Um, it's just one of those things you kind of cycle in and out of. When I started, it was white shirts, and then it was yellow shirts. And now we're in uh, we're in gray shirts. Long and the short of it is, they actually stopped making. The shirts that we, the yellow that we liked. Um, this is a bad picture. It makes it look like Big Bird yellow. Um, <laughs> when in actuality, it's a, it's a, it's an orange. It's an orangey yellow. Um, it's much more pleasing to actually look at. Um, and uh, I, I thought they were really neat, but uh, we just couldn't buy them anymore for some reason. Um, Monterey Bicycle Patrol established in 1995. Um, Community Relations Officer Platt and Vinny. They were our two dare officers at the time. Um, purchased two Trek bicycles, actually one, the one, I actually still ride one of the original uh, bicycles um, because I prefer not having suspension on my bike. Um, but that bike was actually donated by Mike Schwinn. That's how long ago it, uh, it was purchased, 1995. Um, we have an identical one to that. And then we purchased two more bikes in 1999, um, one in 2006 and one in 2008. Our newest bike is um, in 08. And uh, so we have six, six bicycles um, that we can use in the um, This is a year old, but we currently have nine officers ready to patrol on bicycles. Um, they're distributed between the three shifts. Um, no officer patrols full time. Um, I tried doing that once, um, and uh, it, it was a no go but I did most of the summers. There was an officer in Omaha, though. I just went to a conference two years ago, and this guy rode every day in Omaha for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, 
And, and I mean, no joke, the only time that he didn't, he, he, uh, he had some kind of a, um, a leukemia or something, um, had some kind of a cancer, and that was the only time that he didn't do that. And he's like, you know, I, I knew that, this is him talking, he said, I knew if I, if I <clears throat> hopped in a car that they would take me off the bike. And so he rode every day. Um, very, very uh, uh, productive officer. He was in one of the worst areas of Omaha, um, did a lot of search warrants, gathered a lot of information, wrote a lot of search warrants. Um, he, was actually, he was actually very well liked for being in that area too. There were several times that there were contracts out on his life um, because obviously when you take dope away from um, dope dealers, they don't really like that very much. Um, and it was other people in the neighborhood, other people that you wouldn't think would, would uh, care you know, two cents about a police officer that actually stopped them and said, no, you're not gonna do that. Um, and they ended up uh, finding out about it through that way. But uh, um, uh, very interesting. It's very, very uncommon to see someone who does it full time. Um, but uh, all of ours are, are volunteers, and they do it when they can. Um, last year, uh, we uh, were able to get uh, Reserve Officer Poli um, through the certification. Um, that's big. It means that when he comes in, instead of riding with another police officer or with another reserve, he can actually hop on a bike by himself and go out and patrol the, the uh, bike pass, um, and then maybe any other um, problem areas we have. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about why that's, uh, that's so important. Um, there are three major aspects of the bicycle program. Um, first is training. There's a 40 hour course to become a bike officer. That's probably the biggest hurdle we have, getting people um, newly trained um, into that position. Um, means that I have to be taken off the street as well as them. Um, but it's a 40 hour course. Uh, meeting the public and maintenance. Um, the training, like I said before, it's a 40 hour course. Um, it's put on by ILEA. Um, I'm a certified instructor with ILEA. Um, it's one of the only certifications where I can do a whole, I can do the whole school here. I can do it wherever I want. Um, send my, my certificate for my uh, paperwork off to the academy. The, the uh, in, uh, director of the academy signs it and uh, we're good to go. Um, but it's a it's 40 hour course. Um, you have to do riding up and down stairs. That's mandatory. Uh, 25 mile ride is mandatory. We have slow speed drills that we do, um, uh, which are very doable, but they're it's demanding. Being able to do slow speed drills in a very, um, very, very tight space is something you have to practice. Um, patrol tactics, uh, vehicle stops, uh, firearms. Uh, speaking about slow speed drills, you have to be able to get through tight spaces. Um, when I actually came here, my shop for the bikes is up on the second floor of the police department. I hopped onto the, onto the, um, uh, the elevator, rode the elevator, got off on the elevator, rode up to this elevator, rode up, and, and you probably heard me um, yell yeah. when I got off because I, there were people standing there, but I didn't know the two captains. And, uh, <laughs> So anyways, I, I thought it was going to be people out there, but I was on my bike. I rode my bike through City Hall. Don't let anybody say anything, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, we call it training. But uh, uh, being able to ride your bike through tight places like that is something you need to be able to do when you're on bike patrol. If it's not like it, just riding down the bike path, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, training, like I said, can be done here or at the academy. Um, later on next month, I'll be going to the academy um, for two days to help them put on their their school, uh, but we can do all the training um, here that we need to do. Um, meeting the public, um, this, is, this is where the bike program um, actually takes shape. Um, you can do that patrolling, community policing, uh, public speaking. Obviously right now I'm doing the public speaking aspect of it. There, there's only one aspect of the police department that's more popular than a bicycle, and that's dogs. Um, I'm not gonna win over dogs ever. I, I don't know what it is, but everybody likes the four-legged, you know, um, cute little pieces of fur that will bite and kill you. But, uh, uh, bicycles are a close second, so um, being able to do, you know, these kind of these speaking engagements um, is, is a, um, a really nice way of doing that. Um, community policing, obviously, this is a, this is a little more uh, um, soft uniform than a regular police uniform. Mm -hmm. um, we actually... Um, in the last couple of years, we don't want to wear these um, uniforms even more, just regular patrolling. Um, people have their 
opinions about that one way or the other. I can tell you this, um, I've lost, I've actually lost a lot of weight. I used to be a bodybuilder, and I'm going back to actually, um, to racing bicycles, which means I need to lose, I need to lose weight. It's all power to weight ratio, right? Um, so up until about a year ago, I was a 250 pound guy um, who six foot, you know, six foot one, 200 pounds ball. Um, it's, I'm not the most approachable guy. I'm a pretty nice guy. Um, but most people, when they see me, they don't think this is the guy that I should probably go talk to. This uniform helps me in being able to talk to people because I'm not that, you know, like I said, 250 pound cop wearing the 1M12 um, uniform, you know, talking to the cop when you go talk or whatever. That's one of the reasons why I kind of like the beard too. Um, some people don't like the beard at all. Uh, but I'm telling you, I have to do I have to, have to do what I have to do. When I became a detective, I grew my hair out. I have curly hair when I have hair. You believe that? Uh, but it was just something, it, you know. But there are times when I have to sit on the ground and talk to people to not be uh, menacing or um, or to feel like I'm, I'm I'm standing over people. But the soft uniform, for whatever reason, helps out quite a bit. And of course, bike officers have that have that soft uniform. We we're the first ones actually to have it. Um, and then patrolling, patrolling's nice. Well, I have people that will tell me I've never seen, I, I had a guy who went into the bike shop today and he was like, uh, you guys have a bike patrol program? And I'm like, well, we've had one for like 20 years now, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the modern era. And he's like, well, I've never seen you. Well, that's a beautiful mm -hmm. thing about being on a bicycle. I can roll right up on someone, I have no idea I'm a police officer. The dangerous part of that is I can roll right up on someone and they don't know I'm a police officer. Um, so, you know, when you're patrolling on a bicycle, you can either be a ninja or you can be, you can try to be very visible too. Um, you know, as, as, as far as being able to approach people and to see things. Um, and I'll get into some of those stories here if we have time later. Um, the maintenance aspect, um, most of our maintenance is done in-house. I have a shop up in the second story of the uh, police department. It's one of the only things you can really put up there. Um, it's uh, major repairs and warranty work will be done in our bike shop. They're all tracks, and so they, they all fall under the warranty of the, the bike shop that we have here in town. Um, the properly maintained bicycles are a must. Uh, one of the biggest things people ask me is how much should I spend on a bike? And it's usually more than what you think. Um, sometimes it's less than what you think, I guess. Um, I, I, in today's market, I wouldn't spend anything less than probably $500 on a bike. And it's because of the, the quality of the components, the quality of the bearings. Um, you know, and I'll have people from Fisher walk in, I'll see them walk into the bike shop, you know, with their Titleist hats on and stuff. And uh, I don't want to spend that much on a bike. And I know they golf, so I'm thinking how much did they spend on that driver? You know, that, one, that they can hit once, you know, for a hole. You know, and it's about as much as that bike. But it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things you get what you pay for. You don't need to pay $10,000 for a racing bike. Um, but there is, there is a, a certain amount of quality. Um, this bike was made in 1994, about 95. And I overhauled this bike several times. And I could fix it. Because the components on it are such that I can do that. Even with them, components actually being fairly old they were of decent quality, so I can actually do that. Um, so, but we're able to do, we're able to do a lot of that um, maintenance in-house. Sometimes when I really get mad, things really aren't going well, I go up into the shop, you know, for five, 10 minutes and uh, um, tune up one of the bikes and uh, things, things uh, um, turn out a little bit better for me. Um, oops. All right, so I'm going to go over the pros and cons of bike patrol here. Uh, we'll kind of talk a little bit about stories. Um, pro is element of surprise. Con is element of surprise. Um, like I said before, um, I have actually been on my bike, and I can, I can think of several times where I, 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 I rode up on stuff that I didn't realize was going on. Um, when I first became a bicycle patrol officer, I was, on, I was on this shift and, and uh, just running hard all day. 
And it got to be like 9.30 at night, and the sun was kind of just starting to go down. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go get me an ice cream. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the community policing thing, right? I'm going <laughs> to eat my ice cream. So I went down to uh, uh, Dairy Queen on, on North 3rd Avenue, and I bought an ice cream cone, and I'm licking that thing, and I'm really feeling proud about myself and talking with little kids and you know, them stickers, you know. And, and so I'm, I'm on the sidewalk, and I'm riding up 3rd Avenue, heading, heading back south. Because I'm, I'm done with my shift. Pretty much I'm done with my shift. And, uh, and I see this guy comes out the back of a house, rolls down the steps, and hits the, hits the fence that's at the end of the, the steps, and then takes off running. I'm like, wow, what's up with that, you know? And I'm looking on my ice cream, and, and I kind of go around the block, and I, and I can hear him kind of doing some things, and I'm still licking on my ice cream cone because I'm not really sure what's going on. And uh, I, get, I get behind this apartment building and there's this guy that's like standing there with his, he's pointing and I'm like, you know, look at my ice cream still. And I'm like, what, what's going on? He went that way. Okay, so I'm still kind of pedaling and I'm trying to talk on the radio and eat my ice cream at the same time. And, and uh, I see this guy wearing a white t-shirt underneath this tree. And he's, he's just laying underneath this tree. So, you know, I kind of put my ice cream down, which kind of stinks, you know. And ask him what he's doing. He's like, sorry, man, I just broke into that place. I stole all that stuff. Well, it's bad, man. So I called a car there, you know, to take care of it. But, uh, you know, I, I just rode past the burglary. And it just happened that, you know, I was there. And it's, just, it's just one of those things. I rode up on other people. Uh, when I first started here, we had... We, we've always had burglaries. Always had burglaries. People say, well, the burglaries are up. When burglaries aren't up, reporting of burglaries is up. But we've always had burglaries. As long as people have stuff, other people want, they will try to take. Uh, but uh, I rode up on, more than once rode up on guys carrying flashlights and two-way radios. And this was before cell phones were a really big thing. And that's, they were going out to burglarize something. And I, I mean, it was just like, we just kind of passed. And it was kind of like, hey, you're a cop. <laughs> hey, you're a, you know, you're a burglar, you know, and I just, keep, I just kept riding, you know, because it was one of those things where I just, you just passed within two feet of each other, called some more cars down and, and talked to them, and, and uh, probably, probably prevented some burglaries that night. We really didn't have anything to, to hold them on, because they hadn't committed a crime yet, right? Um, but they were going out to go do that. Um, we had a... a Plenty of times where you just you just write up on someone. You can write up on a drug deal. You can write up on a, um, a prostitution. You know something like that. Um, it's very easy. Um, people do not do not see you as being a police officer, even with gun belt. And you know, for a while, it's like those orange, yellow jerseys. Were ever, who wears those? But cops. You know, mm -hmm. people still didn't really get it necessarily. Um, Pro side of that, element of surprise, um, able to ride into uh, um, ride into an area. Um, we have this we have this Chad Wright that everybody's looking for right now. If I knew where he was at, I would say just send some bike bikes into the area to sit there. Um, we had a we had a uh, guy who had been wanted for about six months, which is fine because he was hiding out. It was cool. We heard from this guy for like six months, and it's like this is legal. <laughs> well, then he, he went out and was starting to shoot at people. We had like three attempted murder warrants on top of some of these other burglaries and stuff he had. So it's like, well, we got to go find him. Um, and what we did was I would ride into the, this neighborhood because we knew where mom lived and we knew that's where he hung out. That was the common denominator was mom, and, uh, which is almost always the case. Kind of funny. Um, but I rode into the area and a, a police officer on a police bicycle doesn't have to have any lights on. The law says 300 feet to the rear and the front um, with lights. Well, I, as a police officer, can turn those lights off bright dark into a into a um, into a neighborhood. You won't know that I do that because you aren't going to see me. Um, it's not a, it's not so that I don't have to have lights on my bike. I'm a big proponent of lights on bikes, uh, but I would ride um, silently. My my bike and a lot of police uh, bicycles have what's called a silent hub. And so you can hear a little bit of that. When this was a brand new hub, you couldn't hear anything. It just, it was, 
when you when you ride down the street you hear that, that clicking and clacketing um, sound. Well, you, you don't have any of that. So it's dark, riding into the area. Um, I remember actually hitting a big, huge branch. It was like a tree that fell on the road. Um, don't know why that was there, but I broke my radio. And uh, we'd already been looking at this house for like three months. And I remember thinking, man, we gotta catch this guy tonight. So I can blame, you know, breaking his radio on something, you know. <laughs> and, and lo and behold, he was there. He was there that night. Um, but I was able to get into the neighborhood. Um, the way it worked was when these people would see lights of a car, it didn't matter what lights they were, he would go hide behind the house. They would hang out in front of the house, but when they saw lights, they would hang out, they would go behind the house. Well, I came in on a bike, they didn't see me. And so I was able to sit there and saw when any lights came by, that he would hide behind this house. Had some officers drive by, hide behind this house. Well, it, it gave us enough reason to actually bring the whole shift in. Um, we ended up catching him that night. Um, but you had that element of surprise. Um, pro is fast in an urban setting. Um, a police bicycle is considered an emergency vehicle. Um, some, some police bicycles have sirens. And you don't need a center on a bicycle. Um, it's, it's one of those things where people come to bike school and some people have sirens and some people don't. And, and uh, you kind of get made fun of if you have a siren on your bike. Um, you really don't need it. No one's really going to listen to it. Lights on your bike, you don't need them. No one's going to pull over for lights on a bike. They just aren't. Um, Iowa Code covered that and said it's a, it's a police bicycle. It's an emergency vehicle, obviously can't pull somebody over for a looting. They, they run from me, it's not a looting. It's not a marked patrol vehicle with lights. It, it really doesn't matter, but we can, we can do that. You can pull over cars on a bicycle, and one of the things you have to do to pass my bike course is pull over a car on a bicycle. People, this blows people's minds that we can pull over you know, cars on a bicycle, and it really isn't that hard. Uh, we can go out, we, I, I bring the guys up here to the uptown area, and in two minutes you can have a car pull. It's really not that big a, um, not that big a deal. Um, but in like this setting, in this uh, uptown area where you have all these stop signs and stuff, I can get around faster on a bicycle than you can in a car. Even with your lights and sirens on, I can get around faster than you can. There's no, no ifs, ands, or buts about it because I can, I can cut through parking lots, I can go through yards, um, I can come up to an intersection, see that it's clear, and be through it before you, know, you even get anywhere near it. Um, in this setting, um, in this, in this urban, urban type setting, uh, hands down, I can get around faster than the car can. Um, the con to that is I can't transport prisoners. Um, and that can become a, a point of contention on shift. And so one of the things that I might have to do is I might have to come back to the police department and grab a car. Have, have another officer bring him to the police department and then I take him out to the jail. Um, it doesn't always work that way, but if you're out, um, you know, doing things, I, uh, I've had one, one officer that went out on his first night, and he made, like, five traffic stops in, like, 20 minutes, and he had, like, three warrants, drugs, and some alcohol. Just like that. It, it, it's amazing. I can put my bike officers against a car any day, and we can get higher numbers, I can guarantee you that. Um, but you can't transport those guys. It's, it's a, like I said, excuse me, it's a, it's a point of contention. Um, we, had a, we had a bike officer that went out um, one night, pulled over a guy on a bicycle, and the guy had like, oh man, it was like five grams of meth or something like that. Um, he, was, he was transporting it, but he just thought, on a bike, and the cops aren't going to pull me over. It's a pretty safe way to do a business, um, except for that night. Um, you know, but uh, we have we have some advantages there. Um, another thing, another pro officer can use more senses for rolling on a scene. Um, the big thing about a bike officer rolling on scene is that I can hear everything. Usually, it's nighttime-ish, so it's a little bit easier to hear. I don't have my head inside of a squad car. Um, I can hear stuff as it's coming up. I can see headlights leaving and coming and going. Um, I can, uh, surprisingly enough, I can smell things. If, we, if it's supposed to be dry activity, I can, I can kind of smell things. Um, obviously, I can use my sight. I can actually roll into the area and just sit there. If I know that I'm close to the area, I might tell all the other cars to stay out of the area until I get a chance to actually roll in. Because um, a lot of times, 
I can see what's going on without um, without even needing to have a witness. I can see if something bad is happening or not happening. Um, but I can use all those senses because, again, I don't have my head inside of the car. Um, the con to that is um, I don't have a car, a car to hide behind. Um, one of the biggest things that, that we teach officers when they go through our school is um, that this, this is all you got, it's black. So you've got to be able to tell the officers, the other officers, where you're at, and you've got to be able to find cover. Um, we don't have the big, big lights that mark our position. Um, and so a lot of times, um, you know, this is, this is all you've got. And I don't know if you know much about bike anatomy, but probably the most bulletproof part of this bike is this bottom bracket spindle in here. It's a solid piece of machined uh, steel. Um, it's usually a harder, harder steel, not an aluminum or anything like that. Um, but unless you're like a Jedi or something, um, you're not going to be able to use that to stop a bullet. So when you get off the bike, you need to think to yourself, if something happens here, well, what am I going to do? Is it a tree? Is it a car? Is it the gutter? I, I kid you not, you can lay in the gutter in some cases, and that's, it's like having a burn. It's, it's something you can hide in. Um, but what are you going to do? If something happens, what are you going to do? Um, how are you going to mark your position? If you're in an alley somewhere, you have to be able to say what alley you're in, but then you also have to be paying attention to the, to the person that you're talking to and the cars that are coming around because you might want to shine your light in their direction when they get close. Um, because it's, again, it's just all you have. You have your radio, you have your bike, and, you, and your wit, I guess. Um, but it, become, it can become very, very dangerous. You don't have those lights to mark your position. Um, the pro software uniforms help with public contact, perception, we talked about that. Um, one of the cons is you only have one radio. Um, when I started being a, a, a bike officer, cell phones were something that you did not carry around, you know, like we do now. I mean, I, I would not, I, a $600 phone, which is another reason why I think it's funny that people won't pay $500 for a bicycle. <laughs> but I got a $600 phone in my, in my pocket, you know, and I would have never thought to actually have this on me when I was working 10 years ago. And 15 years ago, when I became a bike officer, it was unheard of. You, you might stick it on your, on your patrol bag, but you most certainly would not um, have it on you. So the only thing you have is, is, is very literally your, your radio. And so I'd actually carry an extra battery you know, with me. Um, and then you know, there might be times when I have to knock on a house or something and say, call 911 and tell them that I'm here. You know, the cop on the bike is here. Um, because that might be one of the only ways that uh, um, that you can you can let your fellow officers know exactly where you're at. Um, another pro is fitness. Um, when I was doing this through the summer, those five summers that I did it, um, I was in really good shape. I mean, I was riding around for eight hours a day. Um, um, you know, at different levels of intensity, but. It was a lot. It was a lot more uh, conducive to better fitness, I guess, than than riding around in a car like we do, or like right now I sit in front of a computer terminal and check paperwork. That's that's my uh, the glory of my night usually um, is checking other people's paperwork and, and to see what they actually do as opposed to what I don't do. Um, but that is. Oh, I guess we'll go to equipment real quick. Um, for equipment, these are all these are all uh, things that we have to take with us. Obviously, with the bicycle, um, headlight, tail light. Every bike has a headlight and a tail light. Um, helmet, helmets are mandatory. If you don't wear a helmet when you're riding a bicycle, I'm not going to call you stupid, but I might call you stupid. Um, you know, if you fell six feet off a wall onto your head, you would do some serious damage. Um, and that's basically what you're doing. I mean, I'm sitting six feet up, and I'm moving anywhere from 10 at the lowest to 30 miles an hour, maybe more than that, depending on if I'm going downhill. And uh, you can't always control where your head goes. And many times, 
you'll get into a, you'll get into a, any time that I've crashed my bicycle, I've thought to myself, I didn't hit my head. And then I'll look at my helmet and I'll see scuff, you know, somewhere. So it's very common that you don't even know that you hit your head. Um, so it's, it's very important. $40 is a lot less uh, money than actually going to the ER um, with a traumatic brain injury, um, which is something obviously that um, might not be the easiest thing to even take care of, um, even if you do go. Um, eye protection is a must. Again, if you're riding around in Iowa in the summertime, <laughs> you might lose your eye, yeah. you know, with the size crickets and, and uh, all the stupid things that fly around, the mosquitoes, and you can really hurt yourself pretty bad. Um, in our, in our uh, packs, we'll carry tickets, um, we'll carry tools. Um, Every officer should probably carry a bottle of water with them, um, if not two. Um, you should probably have some food with you. That's probably one of the biggest problems that people have when they start, they start riding bikes, is they don't think, I need to bring food with me. And uh, um, if you've ever ridden a bike over a long period of time, you've probably, um, probably bonked out. Uh, and you just hit that wall and you just don't have any energy at all. Um, so you need to make sure that you have something with you. Um, that you can you can eat or drink that will that will give you those sugars back and be able to continue on because uh, you can easily hit hit that wall and not be able to do anything. Um, I'm Teresa Lang. I'm the communications supervisor, and this is Stacy Rose. She's our lead operator. I've been with the city um, or the city and the county for 24 years. And Stacy's been here for 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, uh, long time in the communications. But we really like what we do and we're glad to be here tonight. So I guess what I've got for you is a short PowerPoint. I think we've got one call that we'll play and uh, Randy can tell you all about, um, <laughs> he can tell you all our secrets because he's done a lot of work in the communications center um, because he works for Raycom and they take care of our our phones and our radios and our consoles and we break a pencil drawer and we go <laughs> Right, Randy? That's right. That's right. Um, first of all, we are um, a joint communication center. So we dispatch for all of Marshall County, not just for the Marshalltown Police Department. Um, you can see there what our mission statement is. Um, we're committed to serving as the uh, critical link between the citizens um, of our county and the responding public safety agencies. And we strive to efficient, efficiently collect and disseminate the information that comes in um, to protect life, property, and the environment, um, thereby making Marshall County a, an enjoyable place to live and work. We have um, our primary goal is to dispatch the appropriate uh, response personnel, whether it be police, fire, ambulance, um, or rescue, with the least possible de delay um, between the time we get the request and the time the page goes out. Um, we want to provide a cons consistent quality service, um, always keeping in mind the safety of the citizens and the public safety units that we provide services We communicate primarily with radios. Um, obviously with phones and um, we have many different um, radio channels or talk groups I guess is the official term. Um, there used to be channels years ago when I started but that's not the case now. Um, we can talk to surrounding counties on what's called a point-to-point -point channel. We can talk to the Iowa State Patrol. We um, have an EMS channel which is the Marshalltown Area Paramedic Service which is the hospital. We can also talk to the city street departments and um, the county road crews. So it's not just the, the police and uh, fire and ambulance that we talk to. We can um, talk to the city, all the city department, city and county departments. There's four administrative lines. Actually, there's more than that now because we added a few lines into, the, into our new phone system. There's six or seven. <coughs> and, um, <clears throat> months can vary. We can get between 6,500 and as many as 9,000 calls a month on our annual months. Summer months are always busier than winter months. Um, believe it or not, severe weather. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> um, 
that can be one of our busiest times. People, um, they just don't know what to do with themselves when the weather gets bad, and a lot of times they'll call us and, and need some assistance. You know, they'll call us to ask if you know, they should go to work. The road, you know, how are the roads? Should they, oh is it okay gosh. for them that we can't tell them whether or not to stay home? You know, but they call us, and we try to answer it as best we can. We're sitting in the basement, by the way, um, so we don't know what it's doing outside. We could be sitting here for 12 hours. It could be a complete blizzard outside, and we would have no idea um, what it's doing. Um, there's a dollar surcharge. I don't know if you've ever noticed on your, your cell phones. There's a, on cell phones, there's a dollar surcharge, and that was just raised last year. And there's a dollar surcharge if you still have a wire line, an old-fashioned phone in your house. Um, if you still have the wire line, that money goes directly to Marshall County and comes back to the 911 Commission. So the 911 Commission oversees our budget. We have a separate budget just for 911. Um, and that the wireline surcharge comes directly back to Marshall County. The wireless surcharge, on the other hand, goes to the state. And then the state has a very complicated formula on how they divvy it out per county. It's square mileage divided by the number of 911 calls times yada, 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 and it's, it can be very confusing. Um, sometimes the state decides they want to keep that money, which is not always a good thing because um, the calls are getting answered here in Marshall County. So, but we do get that money back from the state. It comes back on a quarterly basis. And so far, it's been about $30,000 a quarter. So um, that may sound like a lot, but um, it can take a lot to run a 911 communication system. Running station, safe, running station, safety. Yeah, I need to talk to the detective. This guy's trying to kill himself. I want to talk to a detective if I could, please. Okay, well, I'll send a regular officer out. Is this happening here. now? No, it's in his apartment. Here's what happened. The guy goes on North First Street, and he had an open heart surgery three years ago. I said, don't smoke. He smoked cigarettes, tried very early on, and they had to take him and do an open heart surgery on him. He said, if you smoke one more cigarette, it'll kill you. He went home, he started what he did, and said, cigars. He smoked and smoked and smoked and smoked. They took him in about two weeks ago. He's been in the emergency room for 10 or 12 days. And they got him cut down 108 pounds. He was near death. They sent him home yesterday. Doctor said, he's got one more cigarette, he'll die. And his ex wife just called me and he's just smoking cigar after cigar after cigar. He's trying to kill himself. Okay. His name's Bill White. Um, I don't uh, know what you want us to do. We can't you know, stop somebody home. from smoking. It's, uh, it's not illegal, so. Well, okay, I'm just going to go in now, then he's going to die. Well, if you so. have concerns, we can do a welfare check on you. Yeah. But if he well, doesn't say he's suicidal. Right. He's on welfare. He's on Medicare and Medicaid. He gets hundreds of thousands of dollars for this guy for three years. He does this, then he gets in the hospital near death. He spent, they took him, cut down 108 pounds. His uh, blood oxygen is only 16 now. He's supposed to have 95 blood oxygen. They run him again and again. And he just bounces back. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it's a police issue. Have you talked to his well, wife about it or it's having somebody else? Do. She tried to call his doctor. His doctor's in Iowa City. Tried to get his social worker. He said, can't get an answering machine. Um, yeah, but we have uh, the police he said, he, he smokes one more cigar or cigarette. And he's over there just going. What's he's his getting, address? Uh, Wells on North First Street, Bill White. Uh, he's right across the street from 518. His ex wife lives at 518. He's across the street. And what did his house. wife say? Or his ex wife? Oh, she's just don't tore up. She's trying to get hold of his social worker. Well, it might be best if she goes over and talks to them or something, but the police aren't going to do anything. They can't they make can't it stop. So if he goes, I mean, he smokes 23 scars and kills himself, which he's trying to do right now. Uh, just just call the funeral home when he dies or what? <laughs> well, you call an ambulance if he stops breathing or something, but an officer's not going to go yeah. over there oh. and tell him to stop. Stop smoking. Well, I can't it's anything, but uh, the doctor's told him not to. She's told him about 50 Is there any way you can go over and talk with him at all? Or? Uh, he won't answer the phone now, so I'll just let it go. I was supposed to clean out the thing. I'd let him clean his apartment out, but uh, doctor says he'd be dead by tonight if he's smoking. So, uh, 